the Spot Track Podcast, talking sports contracts, the salary cap, and business of sports. Today's edition of the Spot Track Podcast is presented by Authentic Audio Productions, providing full service audio solutions for you or your company. Get your podcast up and running, properly serviced, properly hosted, and custom content creation as well. Visit AuthenticAudioPro.com today. That's Authentic Audio Pro. Dot com. My name is Mike Gennetti. It is Monday, November 4th. Week 9 is almost in the books for the NFL. The Major League Baseball season is officially in the books, and plenty of option decisions have already been made. Dan Soman's going to join at the back end of this show to talk about some of the more notable ones there. But as always, we got a lead with the Bills, and that is the NFL. Trade deadline is tomorrow, 4 p.m. Eastern. Quite a few moves have already been done. We've got, I don't know, a dozen players that I threw out to the tweeters, Twitter's sphere this morning. Um, I'm trying to keep this as close to the vest as possible. I I know nothing. Let's put that out there. I know absolutely nothing, but I've been doing this about 17 years now, and I kind of know exactly where to go for at least the right information. It's kind of like Woj bomb season where you have to read between the lines with certain people. Uh, Rap sheet being one of them. Diana Rossini certainly being one of them as well right now. And uh, you just kind of kind of feel out the right words, right? Why was a certain somebody inactive this week? Uh, what is being said about a team that is willing to move and maybe maybe move a couple more players than we're even discussing right now? But I've got about 12 to 15 players, mostly defensive line oriented and certainly a couple of wide receivers that I do believe are in serious contention for moving. The, the big one being Zadarius Smith, who I think based on reports and now what we're seeing is probably a couple hours away from being a Detroit line, which makes so much freaking sense and uh, could just absolutely plateau them to a, a real Super Bowl contention situation. I mean, not that they don't look like it already. They even looked somewhat dominant in a monsoon in Green Bay yesterday. So it's uh, it's all signs pointing forward for the Detroit Lions right now. And it appears as though Edge rushing help is on the way, and certainly that's that's an area of need with Aiden Hutchinson's injury. So, uh, I would imagine that that's going to be one of the one of the, the quicker trades to be announced here. Just a couple other names off the top, and then I will get to some injury stuff, and then uh, flip the switch over to baseball. But um, the the wide receiver injuries uh, are absolutely astronomical right now. I think we had six or seven more yesterday. We don't quite know to the extent of what C.D. Lamb and Drake London are going through. Uh, those are definitely the bigger names, but quite a, few, quite a few players going down over the past four to five weeks. It just means that this ridiculous wide receiver market is going to continue to go, and that's going to include the trade deadline. So I've got four names. I think I can sneak a fifth in here on this little trade, t- trade tweet thread bomb that I've put out this morning. Uh, here's one to watch. And I'm getting a lot of flat back for this one because I've put three players from this team out there. And even though they're two and seven, they just have a passionate fan base. It's it's the Giants and it's Darius Slayton. And I realize he's right now in concussion protocol because of a hit yesterday against Washington. And I realize with neighbors banged up and who knows what's happening in a quarterback that this is sort of one of the better options on the team. I, I think I've said all I need to say, right? This is a two and seven team. I I have to imagine Daniel Jones is going to be on a bench here and and it's going to be Drew Locke's team. And this is not about winning ball games anymore. This is not trying to sneak into a wild card spot. This is the number seven overall pick right now. And they need that to be top four if I'm the Giants front office. And by the way, I know Brian Dayball and Joe Shane were given votes of confidence for 2025. That is that is so subject to change. I can't even say it loud enough. All right. So if I'm the Giants organization as a whole, and I realize if they're, you're sitting on a hot seat, you're trying to win ball games right now. So there's probably competing competing situations happening within this organization. But John Mara is one of the more dominant foot on the pedal owners we have in terms of if he wants something done, he will go and get it done himself. And if he steps into this front office and says, we need to lose ball games now, I, I, A, I wouldn't blame him. And B, it's going to make for a mess. And you may have to fire people to do that. And I understand that. But trading 
Olajuwon, the defensive, maybe the best available option completely. Uh, just a young player on a rookie rookie contract that needs a new contract at the end of the season. That's a guaranteed move for me. Darius Slayton, to me, should be that next move for this team. Um, there are other pieces on this Giants roster. I, I realize Devin Singletary just signed his contract a couple of months ago. He's the number two. All right, this is a Miles Sanders situation all over again. He's now the number two because the rookie running back stepped in and really has tripled his overall targets and carries. So. Uh, Singletary is basically on a one and a half year deal. There's a little bit guaranteed next year. There are teams that need running back help now that could easily use a running back this and next season, right? And I know Dallas is one of them. They're not buying right now. Dallas is very similar to what the Giants are in terms of overall remaining schedule and, and plan. And oh, by the way, now they have a Dak Prescott hamstring injury as well. So there are teams right now that need running backs, not just as rentals, but as long term pieces. And I think Singletary fits that boat, especially if you've got a running back by committee. So I'm not sitting here saying the Giants should blow everything up, but they're at that point where if somebody, probably the owner, decides to make this decision and sell pieces to save a couple of million here, to get a couple extra sixth round picks, and maybe more importantly, to ensure that you can slide into the top four of this draft in 2025, this is what it's all about. This is not about this is the difference between this trade deadline and the NBA or the NHL to some degree trade deadline where we see first round picks, major players. It's a it's a completely different mindset with those two leagues. That's not what this league's about. That's why the idea of Matthew Stafford being, being a trade candidate was the real reason that my head just exploded with the whole Ram situation to the degree of... Not only did I think they were going to be sellers, I went and bet them to win the division two and a half weeks ago, and I'm loving that right now. But I, you've, again, you got to read the verbiage. And when you started to hear people talking about Matthew Stafford being traded to a team that didn't have a terrible quarterback situation. Now, I know Darnold has fallen off here a little bit, but that's when you have to start to think, who is telling me this and why are they telling me this? Well, with the Giants, they're saying all the right things. But what they're saying and what they're doing and what they're going through are two very competing things. Um, I would say the same about Carolina, who has admittedly said, we are not fire selling. And yet, right, Bryce Young's back in the fold. They're trying to resurrect some things. It makes sense to move Adam Thielen. It makes sense to take a seventh round pick from Miles Sanders if you have to pay down that salary a little bit. It just makes sense to make these moves. If, if if the plan is, and maybe this is the better way for you guys all to, fit, to, to think for the next 24 hours or so. If you know your team is going to outright release this player in March, and boy, the majority of players we're hearing on the trade block are in that boat, or they're already a UFA, right? They're already going to be a restrict, uh, an unrestricted free agent next March. If we're in that boat, there's no additional dead cap to trade a player right now. That's not how this works unless there's guaranteed salary and there's some finagling you know, with retained stuff. But there's no additional... You are saving cap. You are saving cash, maybe more importantly for some ownerships right now. You are saving cash. It is not about, I'm trying to get a second round pick for this guy. I'm trying to steal value from a player. You're simply trying to get anything for a player you're, you're soon going to get nothing for. Nothing. Certain cases, there may be a compensatory draft pick built into it, right? Maybe. But that's that's getting harder and harder to do, especially with players that we know hold very little value next free agency, right? You've got to get ma- massive, massive contracts to get the kind of draft picks that many of you are thinking your teams should get or not do anything. My point is, if you can get a seventh round pick for a player you really don't want now and certainly don't want in March, you do it because you're saving yourself... 600,000, 800,000, 1.2 million in some cases. It's just worth it. I know the numbers seem irrelevant because we think in tens of millions in this league, but $800,000 saved is a minimum salary next season. And you're probably carrying 40 of those starting May 1st. That that's what you can look at it as. We've already co- we're covering one contract next year. We got an extra 7th round pick. And maybe something else good comes from this. You know, maybe we move up one draft pick because we've traded two or three players at the deadline. 
it's a terrible process to think about, but that's how many selling teams are thinking right now. They're thinking about February and March and certainly the April draft. So again, don't don't go in here thinking that you shouldn't trade Darius Slayton because you can't even get a fourth round pick for him. Of course you can't get a fourth round pick for him. He's got 1.6 million left. Um, he's going to be a res- an unrestricted free agent. The, the marriage is over with so many of these players that we're talking about here in terms of their team in next season. Salvage something. Salvage something right now and see what you can do. A uh, couple names here. I've got Elijah Moore, wide receiver from the Browns. It seems like the wheels have completely fallen off there as expected. That's why Zadarius is on the move. Uh, Elijah Moore has got to be in this conversation because he has had at least flashes of being, I don't know, a number three option. Certainly hasn't lived up to his draft billing. Certainly was exiled out of the Jets situation uh, along with many other players. But there was a world where you know he was a viable option, at least inconsistently speaking. You throw him on the back end of the Chiefs right now, who I think want one more wide receiver board before this thing's all said and done. That that might be a marriage right there. You know, to be the fourth option, to be a Sky Moore replacement. Elijah Moore can be that. He's a little pricey. He's about 1.6 million for the rest of the year. So this may be a situation where you have to have the Browns pay some things down here. And maybe you're giving up a six instead of a seventh. That's where we are with that one. Um, one of the bigger fish that I think there are multiple teams in on, he's having a great year. He's had a great two, three years as kind of a comeback to what was a disastrous draft bust. Arden Key, uh, the Titans edge rusher, he's uh, he's the right age. He's the right price right now. Right? He's 28 years old. He's got four sacks, two forced fumbles, almost 20 tackles himself in the eight games with Tennessee. He had another big big day yesterday and a weird win over, over New England. He's less than 900000 for the rest of the season, and he's got a non-guaranteed $7 million next year. Well, that's $7 million. If you're a team looking for, not, for a little bit more than a rental, right? And there may be a few of them out there, like Cincinnati, looking to replace Trey Hendrickson, who's just getting ridiculously expensive, even though he's a damn good player. Let's say you're thinking about this and next year. Well, you've got him and Hendrickson together for the rest of the season where you're trying to salvage a disastrous start. That works. Then you can replace Hendrickson with a $7 million player next year. He's going to want a new contract. But that's not something the Bengals love to do is throw out money when they don't have to. So he's cost effective, certainly this year, but maybe for a team that needs it next year, that $7 million looks pretty darn good and it's non-guaranteed. So if you do have to start yourself into a two-year extension, that's your starting point. That becomes like a you know half your signing bonus. It works kind of in every direction. I think this is a name that's certainly going to move. And this may be one of the bigger returns that we see over the next 24 hours in terms of what the Tennessee Titans can get back for this player because he's really played himself into a really nice situation and Tennessee's going backwards, all things considered. A uh, couple more names here. Again, it's 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 D-line edge rush heavy in terms of what I'm seeing. There's one one offensive lineman. There's a couple out there, but uh, Brandon Scherf, the Jaguars season has completely fallen off. They've already traded left tackle Cam Robinson. It's probably about getting younger in a lot of spots with this Jaguar situation. Uh, we'll see about the coaching staff. It feels like that's you, you know a dead end waiting to happen. Scherf's, Scherf's expensive to some degree. 1.375 remaining, most of that guaranteed. But if you're a, a team in contention and you've got a banged up offensive line, especially interior, that's not a ton to take on. All right. And maybe you get Jacksonville to split that in half with you. It's a worthy veteran interior lineman for a team, for a, a situation that you're just trying to get to the finish line for the next nine weeks. And oh, by the way, a return to Washington probably shouldn't be ruled out because certainly they are out kicking their coverage right now. They've got a situation where it's about keeping their superstar rookie quarterback upright. They've got weapons. They're probably looking to add a weapon as well here to go along with McLaurin down the stretch, but bulking up the offensive line for any team with a young quarterback, especially a young mobile quarterback has got to be priority one at all times. Trade deadline, off season, free agency, draft. At all times, you're looking to replenish this pool. Something the Kansas City Chiefs have done a phenomenal job with, by the way. I would be following that model, and that model would include taking a flyer on bringing back a player who spent much of his career in Washington and is sort of at the twilight zone of it, and uh, and at least for for nine more weeks can really help solidify an offensive line that's been good but but needs to be 
deep and solid for the next, uh, you know, regular season slash postseason weeks we have left here. Jadavian Clowney back on this list, kind of the annual tradition. <laughs> Jadavian Clowney, you got a two for 20, by the way. This is not a player on a minimum contract looking to get traded to a contender. This is, this is a bulky contract. Now, there's only 900 and change left on 2024 because much of it was bonus based, but uh, so, somewhat similar to Arden Key, it's 934 left this year and then 10 million with 2 million of that guaranteed next year. So, again, it can be a rental that you just buy out at the end of the year. It could also be it's a rental and maybe we love this guy and we ask him to take a two and a half million dollar pay cut and convert that into incentives. And we've got a very similar 900,000 this year, maybe 7 million next year, and it's working going forward. So uh, I, I would put Clowney on the list. He's had a nice, nice run, nice couple of years here. 21 tackles on a sack so far in eight to nine weeks with uh, the Carolina Panthers who, again, are saying they're not fire selling, but man, they have four guys that over the next 24 hours, they're going to be fielding calls about. And uh, it's really just a matter of connecting a couple dots. It's not that difficult at this point in time. I mentioned Aziz Ajulari, the Giants outside linebacker who's on an expiring rookie contract. He's going to need a really nice payday after the 2024 campaign. Doesn't feel like the Giants are in position to do that, even though Brian's Bur- Brian Burns, you know Andrew Thomas. There's some contracts here, but they're going to be starting over in a lot of regards. We'll see just to what degree. It feels like this guy's on the move. It feels like the Houston's, the Cincinnati's, maybe even teams like Buffalo uh, are in on this one because of injuries, because of needs, because of just a need for depth down the stretch. So there's a bunch of names. Again, follow me at Spotrek on Twitter and Threads. That's where I'm doing most of this damage. I'll continue to do that as. I read between some of these lines and I feel out some of these reporters who do a phenomenal job at saying it without saying it because they are connected and don't want to ruin those relationships. And I respect that quite a bit. So again, if you're seeing a name pop up, it's simply because I'm pulling something from somewhere that I trust. It doesn't mean it's going to happen, but it's worthy to get the information out there. And by information, I mean the numbers, the financials, which is the side that we give you. We're not giving you too much scheme and analysis and football side of it. We're just trying to give you the numbers if and when something goes down. And and if something needs to be retained, like I've mentioned a couple of times here, we'll usually make note of that as well, just to be ready that um, if you're going to try to get a sixth or seventh round pick, you may have to eat a million or so at this point in time to get them off your books. All right, let's flip the switch and talk Major League Baseball with Dan Solman. Dan, thanks for joining. The uh, offseason is off to a ruck. I start here in terms of a couple of big names. And uh, really, free agency doesn't even start until this afternoon, which is kind of a soft deadline as negotiations can ramp up with other teams. And we've seen a few extensions, but uh, nothing really to write home about. We'll get to a couple of those names. Let's go rapid fire here because we've talked about a bunch of this before, but some of this has come to fruition now. Garrett Cole officially opted out. No surprise there. Has it surprised you that the Yankees have given it the whole weekend? Um, no, I don't think so. I think they have a lot of pieces, moving parts to figure out, if you will. So I think there is like some legitimacy to the fact that they could go either direction on this. Right? Yeah, I do too. I mean, we, we talked about it. It's a $36 million buyback, which means they'd add a salary to 2029. He'd be 38 years old. Uh, in 2029 on that guaranteed salary. I did some quick research this morning. There's like five pitchers that have a 2029 salary right now, and none of them are 38. Aaron Nola at 36 is the the oldest player scheduled to have a salary in that season. Uh, It's just not something we see, right? Uh, We see position players go into their 39-40 season because they can just be statue DHs essentially, right? And that's been exemplified with the DH rule in both leagues now. So we're even there though, right? Even those contracts aren't happening that much anymore. Judge got into his age 40 season. Soto might, but Harper didn't, right? Machado didn't, Bogarts didn't. We're seeing teams smarten up at least a little bit on the back end. Is it is a terrible business to lock in Garrett Cole through his age 38 season? I guess is the best way I can say this. In a vacuum, no, but I think the, the Yankees situation is... Um, pretty interesting to do a deep dive on here but um like the short answer is to me no um Mm -hmm. i I mean it it, 
it essentially be five for 180 if they were to re-up this deal. Um, the DeGrom deal, which was signed two years ago, was five for 185. Now it had an additional club option on it, which changes um, the dynamics a little bit. But basically, it'd be it'd be one million AAV under um, the the DeGrom deal, which was signed two years ago. Now right. a lot of people will say that was a, a particularly bad contract, <laughs> but we're only two years into it. It yeah. looks like there might be um, some potential that he comes back. But it's always been a health uh, concern, and we they they sort of knew what they were getting into. So while I why I bring that up is because if we're going to talk about you know age, age like age towards the end of the contract, um, you already know that you're mm-hmm. getting into some injury risk potential there. So to me, um, I mean, I, I think there will be a team that will whether it is the Yankees or not. I think there will be a team ready to give him that de- you know a similar so that's deal, my next question right let's say the yankees get past to today's five o'clock deadline and he hits the open market is it a slam dunk that this five for 180 is out there but from somebody else to me yes i mean i think he would get that i i do personally think he would get that now maybe somebody who's done more work on the degrom market at the time could poke holes and say that the Rangers um, went above and beyond to get him and nobody else was in that territory. But um, I mean, we're, we're going to see retread, you know, Mm -hmm. garbage heap style pitchers get signed for, um, you know, seven to $12 million on one year deals. um, Like we do every year, just because we, the the need for it is so apparent throughout the league um, that, you know, like a backup quarterback, if you've proven that you have sustainability in this league in any fashion, you're probably going to find yourself a deal um, at you know some place in the league. But that's that's my opinion. I'll, I'll push back a little bit. Uh, by the way, just our algorithm, our math the, that spits out not only uh, you know a price point, but how many years based on how the the market at starting pitchers going. Our price point for Garrett Cole on the open market right now is five years, one hundred and seventy nine million. So this couldn't right. be a more congruent situation, right? Like everything, all the numbers we're hearing are about exactly where he belongs. I'm going to push back because of what the Phillies did last season. The Phillies took 34-year-old Zach Wheeler in an expiring contract and and pushed him out an additional three years, $126 million. That's It's a flat $42 million salary this year, next year, and in 2027 when he'll be 37 years old. I have a feeling... That's the direction Garrett Cole goes if he hits the open market. Not that he wants to. He'd love to have a five-year contract. But I think we're going to see teams finally start to screw the pooch on AEV, start to realize that paying a $4 million tax bill because you're $10 million over the threshold isn't really that big of a freaking deal because it's not at all right in the grand scheme of things. But if you can add Garrett Cole at three or four years when you know you're in a in a pretty good situation with him, he's been crazy healthy. Knock on wood. I realize he had a uh, an uh, elbow injury this year that shut him down to 17 starts, but before that, 33, 33, 30 starts. He's just been unbelievably durable for his position. If you can get him at three or four years, and it costs you 44 million a year, right? Which is a crazy number. We're, now we're into that Scherzer Verlander stuff, right? But that's why I think we should be going with this three to four years. In the 40s, AAV, don't don't push yourself out to that fifth year. That seems to be the dinosaur move that needs to get deprecated from this league. Still, I, it, it's all it might be hearsay because I think the Yankees probably extend this thing anyway and go for the five for 180. But it's interesting to to, to at least acknowledge the fact that we could have I don't know a, a top three starting pitcher in baseball hit the open market in a couple of hours here, right? Yeah, that's I'm I'm totally on board with that. You, we have both been advocating yeah. for this style structure for years now, so I, I'm fine with that. I I'm simply saying um, he opted out of that deal because he knows that he that's is right. going, like he doesn't want to leave the Yankees or like a competitive team like that. I assume he's just trying to maximize what is probably going to be his last big deal of his career. So um, he's using the tools set up within that contract. Um, and I, and I saw a little P uh, a little blurb about how the, 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 the language of this was almost intended like both sides 
were going to uh, like there was some inkling that both sides would be ready to move on um, when this when this um, decision came up. So uh, I guess I can't speak to that. But yeah, I'm on board with a, a shorter term, bigger deal. Yeah. Um, is this a trend we start to see more of? I mean, I hope so, but I think players, players plus agents are going to look for the term. I, I, I mean, I don't know. It's it, this is going to loop back into injuries and health and and what the the overall direction of the league. Uh, I Big mean, <laughs> I have trouble thinking they're going to leave a lot of money on the table for less years to to risk the potential that they're not healthy at when they would be due the next contract if that makes sense right so yeah. if we're talking 5 years or 3 years between Garrett Cole I think he would prefer a 5 year deal that is essentially obviously going to be a bigger total rather than just chasing a bigger AAV in the short term um now of course I could be wrong we we saw that really happened with um, Max Scherzer and Justin Verlander, but those were guys specifically at the end of their careers. Yeah. The Zach Wheeler example is a little bit different, is a better comp with Cole. Um, so I, I could see, I could see that happening. Um, mm-hmm. Again, I, I'm just simply saying, I think the five for 180 is there um, from some way, you know, from somewhere in mm-hmm. the league. So I, I do too. It's interesting what you said that, that you think this was, this was written because it was going to be a divorce. That's probably right. That's prob because why else would Garrett Cole accept this? Right? Why why would he, why would Garrett Cole and his agent accept giving the Yankees the ability to void his player option essentially, right? Like that's that's what that's what has been built in here. It's very rare because of everything you said. When MLB players get to free agency, they want all of the control for the rest of their careers. They have been they have been pigeonholed into team control for six, six and a half, seven years because of the, because of the way the CBA works. And once you smell that freedom, you don't want to give it up anymore. That's why opt outs and things like that are becoming more prevalent. But we're not seeing this. We're not seeing like a give and take where I can I can be free except for I can't be. But you have to pay me a pretty good amount of money to keep me off the open market. I don't think it's a trend. I, I don't think many agents will will do this for their players. They'd, they'd rather go to a worse team on a guaranteed contract. You know, to your point, I think that's the trade-off here. The Yankees had a little bit of leverage because they're the Yankees and they probably still have that leverage. And it's one of the reasons they may not take this offer. They may, they may make Garrett Cole go to the open market and try to find one for or five for 180. And when he doesn't, and when somebody's out there offering maybe four for 175 or something along those lines, right? Those higher AAVs that we're talking about. Now the Yankees just have to play ball in that regard. They just have to come up and match kind of like a restricted offer sheet. And uh, I, I think it's interesting from the team perspective. I don't think this becomes a player trend because it seems like too much control being relinquished. That That's a good point. That's probably under discussed on this whole thing that like it, if he technically becomes a free agent here in the next you know 48 hours that doesn't mean he's not going back to New York. Hell no. they, could, they could easily say go test the market and he finds five for 200 and then the Yankees that that was the cost that was the risk they were willing to take and it cost them an extra 20 mil to bring him back but I I, and maybe that market is less but I'm just saying theoretically I would I would think there's a little like he could fetch a little bit higher than that rather than it's destined that he would get lower than that total but regardless I think that's a good point that right um, there's like everything is on the Yankee side here Dan right they just went to the World Series they just won the AL pennant right and they did so, by the way, with Garrett Cole missing half a season. So they've also got that in their back pocket, which is, you know, not not nice. But of course, everything everything comes into play in negotiations. I, I'm not positive. I agree with you. I'm not positive. I, I mean, look, uh, Theo Epstein and Major League Baseball are sitting in boardrooms right now for the next six weeks, right? Winter meetings. And their priority is going to be fixing the, the issue with starting pitching in this game. It's, it is the number one thing they're going to be talking about. Last year, it was the, t- the pitch clock and the pace of play and all that. This, this year, it is about starting pitching because A, they're not being utilized. B, they're getting hurt left and right, up and down. It's just becoming a deprecated, devalued position. 
And if that's the discussion happening at the top, why would we expect that 34-year-old Garrett Cole can go out there and get five for 190 or five for 200 just, just because he hit, he's been who he's been? It seems like, for the most part, most teams are saying, screw this. We're just going to go and, and revolving door this position and bring up our, starter, our, our youth and hope we can get two and a half years out of them before they get injured. And, you know, it's just sort of where things are going. Now, he's, he's a unicorn type player. We've talked about it here. It's, it's not, I, I'm probably miscarrying him a little bit. But if that's happening, right, if most teams are saying, why would we overpay for starting pitching when everybody's getting hurt anyway, or we're only getting four and a half innings out of them per start anyway, which is where I think we're, we're headed towards. So I'm not positive. And I think it might be a good bet by the Yankees to let him walk, to let him do his work and to let somebody try to blow him out of the water. And when they don't, again, we're the AL pennant winners. You want to come back? It's going to be at this price. So I, I do think they have a little bit more leverage than maybe people are leading on to, but we got to move on here. All right. Uh, Blake Snell, he's opted out. That was no surprise. He's getting his multi-year this time, right? Three, four years fully guaranteed. Probably nothing more than that. Um, that seems the direction it's going. Yeah. This wasn't like a, I'm opting out to get a monster AAV deal. He'll probably no. get something um, in that 25 mil range, um, but for multi-year. Yeah. So I, I'm on board with that. Yep. Okay. A um, couple of other decisions that were interesting. We got to talk about this Devin Williams one. First of all, you were all over this. Like you, you and I have been doing the option stuff for a couple of weeks now, just trying to get ahead of the ball game. And you were all, this was even right around that time that he got blown up by the Mets in the NLDS. But it was, uh, it was pretty clear to you that the ten and a half million dollar club option for Devin Williams was too much. That they could revert him back to arbitration his final year and probably save I don't know one one and a half million. Is that that's obviously where we're headed here, right? Does yeah, it go, I, does it go further though, Dan? So a we're there. It's he's arbitration eligible, but is this going to be a an uh, an arbitration avoid and then a trade for Devin Williams? Do you think it's going that far? Right. I, let me re just phrase what. Uh, I, the the ten and a half isn't quote too like I don't want to think it's too much but the Brewers are a very financially savvy situation or sorry organization um they are really good at maneuvering the arbitration process um yeah this was set up for them once he got hurt and missed a good chunk of time this year um like the stats for you know his platform year which would be analyzed for his 2025 arbitration salary that is going to be heavily weighed off of 2024 stats. He missed time. Those counting stats are obviously lower, which yeah. has a trickle effect. So this was just probably a calculated gamble on the brewer side saying, we think that we can go through the arbitration process and owe him less than the 10 and a half mil. I've, but I do, I've I, got him at 8.4 million, Dan. So I've got exactly. him a little bit over 1.5 save doing this. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, that was a clunky way of trying to explain that pretty simple uh, Delta there. But um, yeah, so th that that's really all it is to it. I still think he is in the upper echelon of closers in the league. I think the Brewers still, you know, there's going to be some decisions that might, uh, you know, push them in a certain direction on whether they're like legit contenders or, or just kind of like in purgatory. But um, I, I think they're going to want to contend, try and contend again this year. Um, but maybe if things go the other way, then yeah, he is a prime candidate um, for for a different. Candidate. Yeah, I keep I keep reading it that that the move is to decline him, lock him into an arbitration salary, and then feel out his trade market. I, they're going to do that, and they're going to try to get blown away. But they walked through this division last year, and it was kind of without him for half the year, as you noted, right? So. Do they need him to win the division again in 2025? Maybe not, but it's probably better to have him than not, uh, quite right. honestly. And then if you have to move him at the trade deadline, you do so. I don't think the the I don't think the trade the trade price now is that much bigger than it's going to be July 31st. Do you agree with that? Um, I, for the most part, yes. I think it could be a sneaky big. Um, yeah a sneaky good market for him though. If the right teams get involved that really want to sure up the back end. I, I think we discount how good he has been just as a reliever period. He was hidden behind Josh Hader, obviously for a number of years. So I think, um, yeah, I'll give you the one team that probably overpays for him. Right. And that's gotta be Baltimore who more than any contending team. And they have to be considered that based on what they did for most of last season. 
the, the, the Craig Kimbrell debacle and then having a couple of injuries at the back end of that bullpen as well. If you bring in a guy like this who has pedigree for 40 saves and is not 40 years old, right? I, I think that's a team with a ton of young prospects that Milwaukee would be listening to quite a bit. Don't you agree? Yeah, I agree. I'm also, I mean, this is so cliche, but I, I could see the Dodgers sniffing yeah. around this. I mean, yep. the, he, the, the metrics on his, uh, on his pitches are like, I, I could see the Dodgers wanting to rework some stuff with him and maybe unlock something even further. This, it, it's just the, that they would have the, the prospect capital that the Brewers <laughs> would be chasing. Um, so that, that's like another, I'm just saying, I'm looking at any contender, um, you know, that wants to shore up things on the back end could theoretically um, come calling because it should provide some value by the end of 2025. Yeah, no question. Uh, he's an interesting guy though, because he's had, I don't know, a little bit of a Jekyll and Hyde six, seven years here, Devin Williams. It's been up and it's been down. He's been up, was behind Josh Hader for a while. Uh, Hader kind of went up and down himself, still got a ton of money. I, I'm, I'm with you that I, I have a feeling the next 18 months leads to one of the bigger reliever contracts in history for Devin Williams, despite all this kind of roller coaster ride. Uh, we got to talk angels. And I know this is like an annual tradition of ours like, to find a reason to crap on the Los Angeles angels, but this might be another one. <laughs> I have not got your thoughts on this, this early trade. By the way, when the clock turns to Halloween, we can just expect that the Atlanta Braves are going to have nine moves ready. Uh, that's just what this front office is doing. It's pretty remarkable. Uh, every every offseason that Alex Anthopoulos has been in charge, he's been one of the first teams to make a move, and it's been move, 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 move. They tweet out all of their moves, including all the financials of their moves, all the Ronaldo Lopez extension stuff, the Aaron Bummer stuff, and then this trade, Jorge Soler for Griffin Cannon, all kind of happening in a 72-hour window. All are pretty damn impactful. Because uh, you're, you're locking in some some relievers now for the next two, two and a half years with club options. And the Solaire trade wasn't a surprise. It was on my trade list, many trade lists, because he was so, sort of like a an injury replacement rental at the trade deadline because he was familiar with the roster and he can mash some home runs. The Angels acquiring him for one of their better starting pitchers who just needed an extension. I mean, it's not like this guy was going to be a top of the market starting pitcher contract, right? He was heading toward his final arbitration year. He's been up and down. I thought he had a nice 2024. I thought many of the pitchers for the Angels at least had 75% of the season go well for them. What is this? Is this them officially trying to not spend money? They have... 25 pitching prospects that they've drafted over the past half a decade. You read that a lot better than I read that. Are there, is there, are there troops coming from the prospect pool that they can start to bring forward to major league baseball ready and have a rotation of young arms that they can start to build a run? Or is this as confusing to you as it is for me? Yeah, I have no idea what, I, I mean, I just, I don't know what is going on with this move specifically. Like I, I'm, I'm someone who thinks Griffin Canning probably needed a change of scenery, not because of him more because the angels, it's yeah. just like a, a guy with tantalizing upside that could go to a new organization and really explore. By the way, he went to a great one. <laughs> I mean, exactly. Exactly. Cow. So, and then the return is just very confused. Like the return of Jorge Soler is, is confusing to me. I don't really know. I don't know what the angels are doing. I haven't for a couple of years now, so I don't really want to speculate too much on the good or the bad here, but it seems like another Braves fleece to me. I mean, a, a team that needed some, some starting pitching depth, wanted to get, um, wanted to add in that department. Um, I mean, Soler was, I, I mean, uh, what they, they, they replaced Otani's home runs. Is that, was that the plan? <laughs> Is that all they're looking to do is replace Otani's home runs? That's what Jorge Soler gives you nothing more than that. He's a doubles machine and a homers machine. Yeah. But this is not a lineup ready to drop in this kind of player and just markedly get better. I'm trying to read it because it's early. I'm trying to read if this is step one in an aggressive Angels offseason. Right? I do the, do you, is there a mixture of prospects with... 250 million of, of spending this off season that can make them somewhat relevant, Dan, or, or are they still a year away from being a year away? I mean, with all due respect, I'm, I'm kind of sick of like projecting the angels as yeah. playing chess instead of checkers. You know, like I, I, like whenever they do this move, we always try and like get contrarian with like why they're doing it. And I'm just, I, I I'm sort of tired of it. So I, I don't, 
think there's like some grand scheme plan here um personally but I, i'll be I, i'll be proven wrong <laughs> <laughs> no no it, they haven't been good at that either don't worry um okay the biggest name i'm gonna finish you with a uh just an absolute the your your worst enemy right which is just a, a question off the top that you hate to answer the biggest name that moves this off season it can be a softball. It can be, you know, something deep down. But the biggest name that moves, and you can include Garrett Cole as a free agent move if you want to. Oh, um, man, I off the top of my head, I mm-hmm. don't have someone locked and loaded. But I, 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 I mean, the Devin Williams thing, since we already touched on it a lot, yeah. I do think that is super reasonable. Um, the White Sox guys should just does be, Garrett does Garrett Crochet go? I I think he has to. Yeah, I think he has to. And and, and Luis Ro- Robert should as well. Um, what about the Blue Jays, Dan? Because to me, the, that's the one team that could shake this whole thing up. Yeah, I would assume they're holding out hope of luring. <laughs> Juan Soto before they like tear things down, but maybe that is another, um, yeah, kind of pressure point in their off season, whether that happens or not. But, um, I mean, I don't have any juicy, juicy names, I guess right now. Um, I mean, Vlad would be the juiciest one in my opinion. Vlad right. I'm, tr- I'm trying not to go with like, uh, the guys you probably heard me say is yeah. suggest, uh, I, I don't really have anyone new I've uncovered quite yet though. It's um, not the best list. I put a list together. It's a bunch of athletics, right. as you might imagine, a couple of Marlins, um, a couple of guys that I've got on the list because I, I'm just kind of preparing for if Juan Soto signs there, right? Like Nick Castellanos, uh, to some degree, some of those Blue Jays players, um, uh, you know, there's some teams that are maybe fringe with him that could be getting involved here, but Devin Williams is on the list. I think Jordan Montgomery, just because of what went down last year in Arizona and Arizona probably needs to shake up something uh, a little bit from what they went through last year. And uh, I know you've got Josh Naylor on your Cleveland guardians list just because it's getting a little expensive and maybe he's not, he's not quite rounding into the complete batter, the uh, hitter that they need to, uh, just kind of a one through nine to, to stay relevant and to stay active on the base paths. But uh, the one team that I think will ship three to four players, they're the Carolina Panthers of the, of the major league baseball offseason is the Colorado Rockies. I think they're going to move significant pieces, young pieces, a couple of arms. If you are in need of a fourth, a fourth starting pitcher or a middle infielder or, or something to get that degree, you're probably calling Colorado right now because I have a feeling that a bad team's about to get much worse there. And that's just how things are going to shake out for the Rockies in 2025. But, um, you know, you know, we'll see. I'll, I'll finish with this. Pete Alonzo, Juan Soto, back with the same team, both on different teams or or replacing each other on their current rosters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Because um... the, the latter is very much on the table. With Anthony Rizzo's options being declined and Steve Cohen already coming out and saying, I'm not going to be beat. Yeah, it's actually really. I, I think um, John Heyman put out like a Yankees plan B if they yeah. fail. Um, well, there's a need. Soto there's an absolute need at no, first base. There's no I, question. I, I get it. My, my point is it's just going to be really like from an outsider's perspective, comically devastating to the Yankees. If he yeah. doesn't go, I mean like the cliff from Juan Soto to the next names, like really be well, serious. Well, that's the about. point. Cause right. I've, we, you and I have both watched both of these players ate an absolute ton over the past six seasons. Replacing Pete Alonzo with Juan Soto is the biggest <laughs> disrespect to Juan Soto humanly possible. They just right. couldn't be different players, like more different. I mean, Juan Soto is so calculated um, he, he, he has a plan every pitch, let alone every at bat. And Pete Alonso just is not that player. And he's tried to become that player and he just can't be that player. He's just not. So, um, if you think that's what's you know going to happen for you, Yankees, good luck. Pete's a great player, but that he's not Juan Soto. And my point is you are better off paying 600 million for Juan Soto than you are 200 million for Pete Alonso. If that's your plan. And I think that's how a lot of teams are looking at this right now. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll put it this way. I think Pete is like 
80, I'd say 75, 25 back with the Mets. I'd say Soto is more like 30, 70 to be back with them with the Yankees. Um, yeah, I think the, I don't want to get it. We're not going to spiral this into a giant Yankees off season no, no. thing, but like just between the Cole decision, the Soto's decision and Glaber Torres, I mean, this is like, yeah. 2024 it's the Dodgers off season. It's a billion dollars, Dan. <laughs> no, what I'm it's, it's the Mets 2024 off season where they had to spend so much money just to bring back the same team sure. essentially. And that's where the Yankees are like there, there's some, there's some, there's some holes to fill on that team. Right. And if you're just going to bring back those three guys with at that price tag, and, and I think, ownership doesn't really want to operate like George used to. Right. So that it's going to kind of be one or the other, like they're going to either go after, they're either going to bring back Cole and Soto and just work around the fringes from there, or they're going to not bring back those guys and maybe have a massive off season with more type, like B B plus type free agents. But um, I mean, uh, that that's where I'm at. I just think Juan Soto is such a unicorn the talent, the I age, et cetera, that there is going to like every team with the financial ability to even get close to that contract is going to be in on that. Knowing that the Yankees I, like seemingly really want to bring him back. So of I course they do geared up for, um, I mean, this is, I, I don't want to say this will be better than the Otani stuff, but this is like the last frontier of major, major, for a players while. hitting free agency for a long time. I took a took a cycle through the list the other day. I mean, any like potential superstar that we think of currently is like locked up long term with their team. So like the Jackson Churios, the the Corbin yep. Carroll, those types are not coming along in the next four or five it's, years. It's really just um, Gunner, right? I mean, Gunner Gunner's the one who could hold out here because Baltimore may not want to fire him or, or uh, handle him early here. Um, but I, I was going to ask this question about the Yankees as maybe a final question, even though I've said it four times. <laughs> um, does it make sense to have the Aaron judge contract and the Juan Soto contract on the books basically simultaneously? Um, it's the Yankees. So yes, they should just do whatever. That, that is absolutely the correct answer. Yes. I, okay? I the have doctor to- showed us that it is absolutely the correct answer when you have the right pieces, when it's the right players, right? Mookie Betts, Shohei Otani, Freddie Freeman. Those are the right players to go a billion dollars in on, right? That's it. And Juan Soto and Aaron Judge are two of those players. So I uh, I don't want to hear that you can't do this. This isn't the NFL with a salary cap where you shouldn't pay two wide receivers at the same time. That's not what this is. If your owner's willing to do it, you got to do it, right, Dan? Right. And yes, exactly. Listeners of listeners need to realize that I root for a small market team and yeah. I work for a <laughs> um like a financial a value uh, company. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm constantly <laughs> thinking of this through a value lens, but no, that like it's the Yankees, it's the Dodgers, it's the Mets, whatever they are throwing out the, their bottom line and they're going to do whatever they can to lock this player. I mean, we're hearing that we've been saying the giants are going to get involved. Buster Posey is already saying that, that that they're jumping in this. So when you already have the biggest heavy hitters, the Phillies are in, the Dodgers are in, the Padres are in, the the Blue Jays are in every rich city in the world wants Juan Soto. (laughs) Exactly. That, I mean, can we just, uh, we're, we'll spend 30 seconds on this, but Juan Soto, the, the Dodgers should definitely not be slept on. A, it's happening. A, also. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. The writing on the wall is yeah. there too, with this talk of how Boris and him don't really want to settle for deferred money. Do like, don't you think there could be some signal there that the Dodgers have went so heavy on deferrals in recent seasons that maybe they wanted to free up some um, shorter term cash flow, if you will? Uh-huh. Um, I don't know. I just think that they're like brewing a super team over there. Um, uh huh. And it's going to be scary uh, for Yankee fans if. Uh, All it would mean happens. is you don't bring back Teoscar Hernandez. It's that simple. Pretty simple. Yeah. Everything else is just money. And that's really none of our concern because it's not our money. We just have to follow it and track it. You know what I mean? But that's this is one of those leagues where it just doesn't matter. If you're willing to be a taxpayer and if you're willing to be a $100 million taxpayer, you're allowed to in this league. There's there's really nothing pushing back against you. So to say that the Dodgers can't do it, 
Now, I don't, I'm with you. I don't think Soto and Scott Boris take the deferred money. Otherwise, he'd probably be signed in Washington right now because Washington tried heavily to do a massive deferred $500 million contract three and a half years ago. And that didn't work because they wouldn't take it then. I don't think anything's changed. I, I just don't with that. So uh, we'll see. I think there's a dozen teams at least offering 500 million, which is pretty astronomical. But your point is is pretty rich. Let's enjoy this for however many weeks we get with the Juan Soto tour because it's going to be bear cupboards with major contracts in baseball for a while here. Let's put it that way. Yep, I agree. All right, man. We'll keep up with it. Thank you. Thanks, Mike.